excited. We've been really, really looking forward to having Greg present tonight. Um, before we start, I invited Brendan, who is one of our board members, to do an official introduction for Greg. So I'll hand it over to Brendan. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. So our speaker tonight is Greg Jones. Uh, Greg is a certified registered nurse anesthetist with a second specialty as a family nurse practitioner from UNR. He has supervised over 10,000 ketamine treatments for our community in Washoe Valley in 2023 alone. But there's an interesting story behind his passion for ketamine. He first discovered ketamine as a mental health treatment by accident over 10 years ago. A patient who was a psychiatrist asked Greg to administer ketamine to him while he was undergoing surgery. The patient had read studies that showed it could help improve his depression. Since that moment, Greg's passion and curiosity for offering ketamine as a mental health treatment exploded like a wildfire. This led him to open Radiance Ketamine Clinic in Northwest Reno. To this day, it is one of the largest Spurvato providers in the nation. In addition to work with Radiance, Greg also loves tending to his worm farm, cooking delicious food, and building edible gardens, but hates automated phone insurance systems and fiery passion. <laughs> He is a champion for demystifying psychedelic medicine for the Reno community and is dedicated to presenting inside information about the secrets of psychedelic medicine. Without further ado, I present Greg Jones. All right. Uh, thank you so much for coming tonight. I've been looking forward to this. Um, I'd like to thank Kate and the entire SBS team for inviting me to speak. Um, thank you for your interest in learning about um, ketamine and the ecosystems that we're going to be talking about tonight, the psychedelic ecosystems. Before we start, I'm just gonna, I just have a few quick disclosures I have to disclose. So I am the co-owner, co-founder, and clinic director of Radiance Ketamine Clinic here in Reno, Nevada. I'm also the co-owner of Brain Health Restoration, also in Reno, and uh, the co-owner and co-founder of Vivid Life Ketamine Clinic in Concord, California. I'm also a paid... Um, speaker for Janssen Pharmaceuticals, which is the manufacturer of Spravato, the nasal form of ketamine treatments. So, um, like I said, tonight I'm going to be talking with you um, about ecosystems um, that you may or may not be familiar with, um, but I'm excited to um, cover them and how, what they are, how to um, take care of them, and how that can affect our psychedelic journeys. So, um, based on the information I could find on Google, um, which, you know, uh, <laughs> sometimes is right, sometimes is not on Google, but um, for every 100 people that use psychedelics, there are only, uh, only about one of them uses it in a clinic setting. So the information I'm gonna provide tonight is, I, I feel like a little unique only because it comes from lots of experience of giving, giving, giving psychedelic treatments in a medical setting. So I've uh, been involved with over 10,000 um, ketamine treatments uh, in the Reno area, uh, particularly in Northwest Reno and Radiance Ketamine Clinic. Like I said, this is information that you probably won't find on the Google search I'm gonna be providing you with tonight. Um, and it comes from 50 plus hours of working in a hustling, bustling ketamine clinic, psychedelic clinic. So I'd like to start off with a little joke because, you know, it's fun. Um, so, some people say that ketamine is only for animals. My response to them is they need to go off their high horse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so before I get into the ecosystems that we're going to be talking about tonight for psychedelics, I want to give a ketamine crash course. I get lots of questions from people on the street in our community about ketamine, what it is, how we do it, stuff like that. So I'm just going to provide some basics on, the, on ketamine and then we'll get into the psychedelics. So ketamine is a dissociative anesthetic. As the name implies, it's used in anesthesia. Um, in high doses, it causes um, people to become unconscious, allowing surgeries to happen. That's how I have given it for over 10 years, is in anesthesia, in the anesthesia realm. Um, it, is, uh, it is a drug that increases a neurotransmitter inside of our brains called glutamate. Glutamate is the most abundant, positive, natural neurotransmitter in our brain. A neurotransmitter is a chemical that, that our brain uses to communicate, and um, we have different types of neurotransmitters. Some are uh, stimulatory, positive, some are inhibitory, negative. 
Um, but glutamate is, like I said, the most abundant stimulatory neurotransmitter inside of our brains. And it increases that. So it's kind of like fertilizer um, for our neurons. And I'll go into that more in just a minute, but it, it helps the neurons grow, function, and connect better. It uh, increases something called neurogenesis, which is the formation of new neurons inside of our brain. And it also increases something called neuroplasticity. I'm sure a lot of you, if not all of you, have heard of the term neuroplasticity. It's a hot, hot term right now. Um, neuroplasticity is the ability of neurons to change, to become plastic and moldable. Um, Michael Pollan, which I'm sure a lot of you know, um, gave a great uh, metaphor that our thoughts are like sleds going down the snow hill. When we're young, this, uh, our mind is fresh and um, has brand new snow on the snow hill. Our thoughts can really go anywhere, right? And so over the years, as we have these same thoughts, these same patterns, we create these grooves um, down this snow hill. So we tend to have the same thought patterns over and over and over. And if those thought patterns are positive, awesome. If they're more negative, it's harder to change them because they're grooves, right? Imagine being a little kid trying to change your your um, the, the course you take down uh, a snow hill if you're in a big groove. And so getting ketamine or a psychedelic is kind of like putting down a new layer of snow and actually allowing those thought patterns to change, to make new connections inside of our brain. And um, it, uh, an important way that it does this, it increases um, something called BDNF, um, which is brain-derived neurotrophic factor. Um, and that, again, is kind of like fertilizer. Um, it works differently than regular antidepressants. Um, regular antidepressants um, work on different neurotransmitters, like dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, that increase the amount of those um, chemicals between neurons so that they can communicate, um, hopefully, better. And so, um, again, uh, ketamine works on glutamate, which is a very different neurotransmitter, in, and instead of just helping them communicate, it actually helps them grow and connect and, and make new connections. So in conditions like depression, we've discovered that um, the brain may not be functioning to its max maximal capacity. So this is an MRI of someone's brain with depression and someone's brain without depression. You can see the difference in activity going on between the two brains, right? Um, and this is, a, this is an image of a neuron before ketamine and 24 hours after one dose of ketamine. So you can see the increase in the thickness of the neuron here, um, but also these little things. They're like little hands, they're called dendrites, and those are what our neurons use to send and receive those neurotransmitters, those chemicals to communicate. So you can see all the growth that's happened after just one ketamine treatment. It's pretty phenomenal. You can actually visually see it on the scan, um, which is really, really incredible. So beyond um, helping neurons connect and grow in our brain, Another way that ketamine works is it creates a dreamlike state. Um, it's really hard to describe, just like many of you know, it's hard to describe a psychedelic experience. Um, but um, it, uh, ketamine can create this dreamlike state that people are able to think about things differently. It dissociates them, it, it creates some distance from themselves and their thoughts. And so they can get a different perspective. Instead of being first person, seeing problems head on, it's almost like it changes you uh, to third person outside of looking in on yourself and your emotions and thoughts. And so this altered state is another important way that ketamine helps with mental health. Um, so even if somebody doesn't get into it, this altered state, I, I have a number of patients who really don't get that altered with ketamine treatments, but their mental health is much better. So it's not required to get into this state, but we feel um, that getting to this state is a, an important way that it can work and, and help people kind of process things differently. So what do we give ketamine for um, at our clinic? So we give it for major depressive disorder, PTSD, OCD, anxiety associated with depression, and um, complex regional pain syndrome, which is a really difficult um, neuropathic type of pain that's really hard to treat, and thank goodness ketamine can help with that. Um, so uh, information about studies done on ketamine. So uh, there are a number of studies done on IV and IM, which is intramuscular ketamine, given as a shot. 
Uh, we normally do it in the shoulder. Um, studies show that it, the range is about, about 30 to 70 percent of people experience a remission where their depression pretty much goes away. Um, and you know, most of those studies are smaller because big pharma is not involved, and so they, it, normally it's um, like doctor's offices or um, maybe universities that do a smaller scale study, but uh, there's been a lot of them. And the uh, remission rate is somewhere between 30 and 70 percent. Um, a lot of people look at that and they say, well, that's not 100 percent. I wish it was. I wish it was 100 percent. I wish you know, we had a treatment that everyone responded to. But keep in mind that these studies were done for treatment-resistant depression. So it's a more difficult type of depression to treat that hasn't been responsive to other treatments. So um, 30 to 70 percent of people's lives were completely changed with this, which is awesome. Um, Spravato has been shown to um, uh, be uh, people. Sixty percent of people respond to Spravato in a positive way. Forty percent again go into into that remission. It also reduces the chance of relapse of depression by seventy percent. Twenty-five percent of people feel better after one treatment. Um, this is really important um, because if anyone has experienced depression, every single second in a pit is agonizing. So the quicker you can get somebody feeling better, the better, especially if they're suicidal. It's particularly important. So this is a study um, that was done, a five-year study on sperm auto. Um, and I just want to point out here, so this initial part here um, is the induction phase. And in this phase, the depression scales dropped by about 13 points on the Madras scale. If anyone's familiar with depression scales and how likely people are to have a change in depression scales, you will know that that is a huge reduction, uh, 13 points um, in a very short amount of time. And so this study, like I said, it goes on for five years, and the uh, participants were able to maintain their improvements. So uh, over five years, the overall change in that decrease in score was only 0.1. So people were so those who responded were sustaining their improvements, which is huge. One of the criticisms of ketamine is, yeah, it's great, but it doesn't last. I hear that, right? Which is true and not true. So it's true in the sense that generally one treatment, you know, it, it's not a cure. It do, the effects do wear off. But the good thing is that people uh, sustain treatment, maintain treatment, they're actually able to maintain these improvements. And we see that with patients in our clinic. Um, and so I'm truly grateful to be able to offer a treatment that helps and is sustainable. Especially, I mean, these patients receive Spravato, which is covered by insurance. So it's also financially sustainable um, as well. So this, this, the studies and this improvement was so big that the Journal of Science said ketamine is the biggest breakthrough in depression research in 50 years. I'm just going to read that again. Ketamine is the biggest breakthrough in depression research in 50 years. That's huge. That's huge. Um, so how do we give ketamine in our clinic? We give it either through an IV um, or as a shot, an intramuscular shot, or as a spravato, the nasal spray that's patented and um, produced by Johnson Johnson and covered by insurance. Frequency of treatment. Most people get treatment twice a week for a month, once a week for a month. And then it just depends on the response. It could be once a week, once every two weeks, once every four weeks, once every six weeks. Um, and we're always adjusting it best based on how someone is doing. But I tell people, my number one goal is to help you feel better. My number two goal is to reduce frequency of treatment as much as we can, but not to the point that it becomes ineffective. And so we're adjusting it based on people's response. Um, cost for IV ketamine. Um, insurance is adamant not to fully cover ketamine treatments, unfortunately, um, IV and IM. So the cost of IV um, ketamine is $400 per session. For the injection, is $300 per session. And then Spravato, like I said, almost all insurances cover it. Um, and so it depends on the plan that someone has, but in general, um, it's around $40 a session. 
Um, many people, though, it's actually completely free. Uh, their insurance fully covers it. Okay, so this is a question I get. Aren't you just getting people high? Well, yes. <laughs> We're getting people into an altered state, right? But it's all about intention, right? The intention is not to disconnect and have a party, right? The intention is to heal. And so getting people into an altered state that produces healing is our goal, um, which I'm very happy to do um, because of the results that we see in people's lives. So all the information I'm going to give to you tonight is not all good. Um, I am going to be sharing an experience of a patient who almost uh, killed somebody and almost killed himself. Um, so it's important that we um, that we know what we're doing and know about these ecosystems I'm going to be talking about and learning how to sustain them in a positive way. All right, so uh, the Kennedy Crash Course is now done. Um, and now I'm going to talk about three uh, psychedelic ecosystems. So a recommendation I have is to have a way to take a couple of notes. Um, in, with these ecosystems, I'm going to be explaining them, but also I'm going to be giving some recommendations on what you can do in your life um, to you know, help sustain and maintain these um, positive ecosystems. So maybe a pen and a paper, maybe an app on your phone, uh, whatever works best for you. Or if you don't want to at all, that's absolutely OK. OK, so the first ecosystem I'm going to talk about tonight is the society ecosystem. So what this ecosystem is, is um, it's when the beauty and magic of psychedelics is brought into everyday spaces. That's our goal, right? That's, and, and SPS is all about that. And so an important way that, that we're making this happen is changing um, drugs from being illegal or decriminalized to legal and able to be used out in the open um, to improve mental health. So how we do that, how we build that bridge from illegal to legal is incredibly important. We all have a role in building this bridge. So psychedelics have an incredible power to unite people. It's really interesting because whether you are on the left side of the political field or on the right side, whether you're religious or an atheist, whether you're pro-life, pro-choice, anti-feminist, feminist, and a bazillion other things, because as humans, there are a lot of things that divide us. If I ask people, you know, what what religion we we are, we have a lot of different opinions and different preferences. Um, but there is an incredible power of psychedelics to unite people. Um, law lawmakers on the far right can get behind psychedelics. Why? Because they want to help the PTSD in our veterans, right? They know about the opioid epidemic and they want solutions. They know mental health is a huge problem. They want something that actually works and helps. So they can get behind this, right? Um, even though typically they're very conservative, right? Um, so yeah, um, psychedelics have an incredible power to unite us as people, as human beings. Um, so ketamine can be an incredible prototype of what future psychedelic use looks like. Because why? It's legal, right? So we can use it in the, in the open, um, which is awesome. Because um, we're working out some kinks and seeing how ketamine can be used in our medical system. Um, you know, most medical offices, go to your primary care. Are they set up to do psychedelics? No. You know, this is a whole new field in the, in the field of medicine. Um, and so it's awesome to be able to build it out and see what that's like. Um, also with insurance companies, you know? Insurance companies are not used to paying for psychedelics, you know? When, I remember when we first started uh, Radiance Ketamine Clinic, calling the insurance and saying, I'd like to get the prior authorization for ketamine. And they're like, what? What is that? You know, and they had no idea what it was. They didn't know what to do with it. It took days and days and days to figure this out and get it th pushed through. And I remember rejoicing when the first one came through. It was a huge deal. Now, it's so much easier. I mean, it's, we do it online, it's, it's a lot easier. Granted, it's not always smooth, but it's a whole lot smoother than it was. And so we're, we're working on, you know, 
working through this um, as a medical system. Um, so I want to share a story about a patient um, of ours and um, <coughs> what he learned about his role in sustaining this society uh, ecosystem. So his name's Michael, he was then changed. Um, he's a young man in his late 30s. Um, he lives with his fiance and works at a local resort. He has a teenage daughter that lives with his ex-wife and he has a really big husky dog. Um, he has suffered from depression most of his life, severe depression. He also has PTSD, anxiety, has tried to take his life numerous times, um, has a history of self-cutting, has tried numerous antidepressants and regularly, regular, regularly uses marijuana. So he was speaking with his, health, his mental health provider about wanting something more. And so his provider said, why don't you try ketamine? And he was like, oh, okay, interesting. So his mental health provider prescribed him some ketamine to use at home. So he started using it and saw awesome results. Um, his suicidal thoughts were down, his mood was up, his relationship with his um, wife was a lot better. Um, so yeah, things were good. So one day, he took his ketamine treatment, waited about a half an hour, and was like, well, I don't really feel anything. Okay, well, I guess that's a dud today. So he decided that he was gonna go pick up, actually, not his wife, his fiance, sorry. He, got, he decided to go pick up his fiance from work. And so he didn't feel altered, but clearly his judgment was altered, right? And so he did, got behind the car, it started kicking in more, he swerved into oncoming traffic. Thank goodness, avoided that situation, but it scared the living bejeebies out of him, right? Um, and so we talked with this provider, and he, the provider was like, yeah, maybe this isn't the best you know, scenario for you. So the provider sent the referral to us. Um, the patient came in, in the initial consultation, we were talking, he told me about this experience and how much it scared him. Um, and, and so he got approved for ketamine, started ketamine at the clinic. Um, I went and talked with him and, and he said, you know, it's interesting, I, I feel like the ketamine treatments I do at the clinic are more effective for me, which was, which was a, quite a surprise. And with, in talking with him, he discovered that the reason he felt that way is because uh, he felt safe. Um, he wasn't worried that something was going to happen. He wasn't worried that he was going to go get in the car. He wasn't worried, you know, whatever. Uh, the, possi the endless possibilities of things that could happen. He felt safe, he felt protected, uh, watched over. And so it, uh, that safety allowed him, his mind to be safe, and therefore go to safe, to, sorry, to hard places because he felt safe. When people don't feel safe, we naturally hold on. We're like, you know what? I'm vulnerable, I'm not safe, I'm not going there, right? And so because he felt safe in this environment, his mind was able to go to these difficult places and he found it more effective for him. An additional benefit is that it was fully covered by insurance. When he was buying it out of pocket, um, he had to pay for it because the insurance will cover uh, home treatments. And um, it, actually his spermatic treatments were fully covered by his insurance. So what did he um, learn in, from this? He reached out to his medical provider and found the appropriate setting for him. Having said that, I am not at all against home ketamine treatments or home use or whatever. You know, we're all the, the point here is to find a situation that is safe for us, whatever that is, whether it means that we have a sitter when we're using psychedelics whether it means that we have somebody there, whether we do it in a group with, you know, um, uh, observation, whatever that looks like, but really finding a, a safe setting for you to do a psychedelic in. Um, and also he discovered, and he realized that, let's say he had gotten into an accident. Obviously that would be tragic. Potentially for him, potentially for someone else, but also, for the society, for the ecosystem, psychedelic ecosystem, because the more news there is about misuse or problems with psychedelics, 
psychedelic use, the more people are scared that it's going to harm our society. It's going to, going to wreak havoc, right? And so lawmakers are like, oh, I don't know if this is a good idea. Or, you know, um, whoever it is. But the more negative news there is about you, um, problems happening with psychedelics, even if they don't know the scenario, negative things happening, happening will hurt the entire movement, which we don't want, which is all of our responsibility to sustain. But building that bridge, right? So, um, like I said, his actions could harm the entire movement. Um, and so he found, he found an environment that was good and safe for him. So the question I get is, why don't you, at Radius Kennedy Clinic, why don't you give ketamine for personal growth and spiritual experiences? I am all about personal growth and spiritual experiences. But we feel like our role, well, one of our roles in this movement as a medical clinic is to do follow the current recommended medical guidelines, which are to give um, ketamine for diagnoses that we're treating and doing it in a safe medical setting. Um, and so if we go outside of that, we run the risk of being closed down, right? And also, what would that look like for our movement if a psychedelic clinic got closed down because of not doing, following the recommended guidelines? Hopefully those guidelines change in the future and we can give it for um, you know, spiritual growth and um, personal growth and all of that. But right now, we only give it for diagnosed medical conditions because we feel like that's an important role that we have as a medical clinic in this ecosystem. Um, another question, why is ketamine unique compared to other psychedelics? All psychedelics have their own properties, right? But what are some unique things about ketamine? Um, one, it's legal, so it can be used in a medical setting. Um, it's covered by insurance, as long as you need criteria. Um, it's short-acting, instead of the half-life being hours, it's minutes. When I turn an infusion off on the ketamine treatment, normally people are back to normal within 15, 30 minutes, which is quite different than a lot of psychedelics that last many, many hours. Um, although it does have side effects, um, you know, that are minimal. Sometimes people get a little nauseated, sometimes blood pressure goes up a little bit, um, maybe a little headache. It doesn't cause, um, like, retching, like vomiting generally um, in a lot of people, that, unlike some other psychedelics. Um, it can happen, but normally it's very, very manageable. Um, and, for example, it doesn't uh, create a serotonin deficiency um, like some others. And so it's a very safe, safe psychedelic um, when used, used uh, correctly. So this is a recommendation that I have on how to, a uh, role that we can take to sustain and support this uh, uh, societal ecosystem. So finding a safe setting um, that is supportive to use psychedelics responsibly. Because again, you know, we're putting the whole movement at risk if we're not, if we're not doing that. Okay, so the second ecosystem is the personal ecosystem. This is um, the number one priority when it comes to psychedelics, the personal ecosystem. So psychedelics can be scary for those who have use them, it can kind of feel sometimes like you're a little field mouse being looked at by this big, you know, <laughs> cat that's ready to eat you, which can be scary. You know, it can be scary sometimes to experience an altered state. And so it's important to have support uh, for your psychedelic experiences. Um, it's important to find certainty and safety. And we're gonna talk about that. How, how do we create the certainty and safety in our psychedelic treatments, in our psychedelic experiences, no matter what psychedelic we're using or how we're using it. <coughs> so uh, we need to surround ourselves with people with support, right? I like to say we're herd animals. We need our herd, right? We need people, we need support. And so there are six key members I'm going to bring up that can really help support us through this journey. First one is friends and or family. Um, some people um, don't actually, I, I find, don't actually talk to their friends or family about it because they're embarrassed or they're scared, you know. Um, but actually, that support is really important. 
granted, if somebody's just closed to it, you may not be able to get that support. But it's interesting how we prejudge people and think, oh, they wouldn't be supportive, when in reality, they very well may be. You know? And so having friends or family that we can talk to that can support us on this journey. Another one is medical staff, whether it be doctors or nurses, um, maybe talking to your primary care and, see, and letting them know that you're doing psychedelics. Um, it's, it's really interesting. So many people call me and, and I'm talking with them about doing ketamine and I ask them, are you seeing a psychiatrist? Are you seeing a therapist? Oh yeah, but they would never be open to this. And I'm like, who is it? And they tell me, and I'm like, oh, they sent us numerous referrals in the past. And they're like, whoa, what? I had no idea that they would be supportive of this. So, um, you know, talking to whoever that is, whether it be your primary care, your current therapist, maybe um, getting a, um, uh, a specialized a psychedelic therapist, a life coach, um, whatever that looks like. I already mentioned the psychotherapist, which is really important. The reason, um, and we are huge supporters of therapy with Kevin, because as many of you know, if you've done psychedelics, it can bring up stuff. It can bring up deep stuff. And having a trained person that you can talk to about that is massively important. Um, feeling safe and secure because they get it, they can support you through that is a really important part of using psychedelics. A driver. Do not get behind the wheel, behind the wheel of a car um, or a vehicle. Um, when you use psychedelics. So whether that is a responsible driver that you know, that picks you up a friend, family member, um, using the Uber, whatever that looks like, but making sure that you have somebody to drive you safely. For ketamine, we require that people not drive until they've had a good night's sleep. Um, having a trusted advisor, that could be a variety of people. Maybe you're a student, and you have a professor that you're really close to that you can talk to. Um, maybe you have a coworker that you're really close to, that you can talk to about this. Um, because, you know, it's interesting, psychedelics, although they're awesome and can open you up and all these things, they can also be isolating in the sense that people who don't really know about psychedelics, it's hard for them to get it, right, um, a lot of times. And so it can be very isolating. And so having people that you can talk to that are, even if they haven't tried it, that they're open to it, you know, you, you can explain that it, I'm really, I'm really suffering, and this and this and this is going on. So, you know, I'm doing psychedelics, and I've seen this incredible change. Or I'm looking into this because I've heard awesome things about it, um, and they can um, be a support to you in this journey. And the last one, particularly particularly right now with ketamine, is insurance. In the future, hopefully, that is also the case for other psychedelics. Um, so, sustainability financially is really important, right? And so getting, making sure that your insurance is on board recovering treatments and make them cost effective for you. The most effective treatment is the one you can actually get. So if you can't you know, afford it, then it's not as, as um, useful. So getting your insurance company behind that is really important. So um, without this ecosystem, without this support through this journey, it can feel like our, our, our ecosystem is a barren, a barren desert. Um, but once we reach out and we make these connections and have the support, then we can change that barren desert to a thriving garden, right? We, and so why is that so important? Because although, although maybe we are doing well, um, having that support can give us kind of like a trampoline, a launch pad to get even deeper results, even more uh, therapeutic response to the, to whatever whatever we're doing. Um, we, we need we need support to feel safe. And, um, so I'd like to share a story about a patient that um, really worked on improving his his personal ecosystem and how that how that changed things for him. So his name is Brian. Name changed again. Um, he is a man in his early 60s. He has been married for 25 years, has two biological, biological children, one stepson, nine grandchildren, is a retired lawyer, lives alone with his dog, and is part of a basketball league. 
So something that I didn't tell you was that he recently lost his wife. They were married for 25 years. You can imagine what that did to his mental health. Deep, deep, deep depression. And so he reached out to a therapist because he needed help. He also talked to his primary care, called an antidepressant. That didn't work, so he tried a couple of antidepressants on different ones and just was still really suffering. He described his, his depression as constant sadness and emptiness. That's pretty hard. He, he isn't suicidal, but he welcomed the thought of not waking up in the morning. Um, so, and, and, all, and even if you got a full night's sleep, he would wake up exhausted because of the physical symptoms of this severe unrelenting depression. So he looked up other treatment options. He needed, he wasn't doing well, he needed, he needed more help. And so he found ketamine. Um, he talked with his primary care, he talked with his therapist, and they were like, why not? Give it a try, you know? So he reached out to us and set up an initial consultation. <clears throat> In the initial consultation, he was really quiet, reserved. He had a hard time forming words. He was just so cloudy, um, really, really depressed. Um, but he started treatment, and his initial ketamine treatments were dark. He would remember times with his wife, they liked to go hiking, so he would be on a trail with his wife and just weep, and he'd be like, well, that's never gonna happen again, she's gone. You know, and it was just dark, dark, dark sadness. And then one day he had a treatment where he was with his wife, remembering walking on the beach. And instead of being like, why can't I do that again? It was like, well that, I feel so grateful that that happened, right? Turning that sadness into gratitude, um, which was the first time he was ever able to do that after our death. Um, and so he started having more and more positive experiences. And so he wanted to fill out this personal ecosystem. He wanted to raise this garden, right, of support. And so he started going to our integration circles on Mondays that one of our academy assistants, psychotherapists, Barbara Chandler, shout out to Barbara, who's awesome. Um, she, she runs that uh, integration circle. And so he came and he was really quiet very reserved, um, didn't really talk much. Slowly he started opening up more and more and more. And he ended up making a friend in the integration group. And they started meeting outside of the integration group and they could relate. Um, they could relate with their depression. They could relate with using ketamine. Again, ketamine or psychedelics can be isolating because he didn't really feel like he could talk to his family. As a, as a father, he felt awkward talk, telling his children, I'm using ketamine, right? I'm a grandpa, but I'm using ketamine, and he just didn't feel comfortable with that. And so it was awesome for him to be able to talk to somebody one-on-one -on -one about what that's like. And so it really, really changed things for him. And so he, um, he wanted to increase his personal um, ecosystem, so he started ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, which made a huge difference. And in those treatments, he was able to really evaluate his emotions and where those were coming from. Turns out, a lot of them really were based on something completely different he didn't even realize until he started this kindness as a psychotherapy. So that support of that therapist was huge. The support of his friend was huge. The integration group was huge. He was building that, that, system, that, um, that ecosystem. And so um, his, his ecosystem went from being dark and alone, right, this beautiful ecosystem as he worked on getting that support for his, his personal journey. No person is an island. Like I said, we're, all, we're herd animals. We need our herd. We need support. And so to think that we can do this alone, you know, is not the best idea. You know, just because maybe you've done a couple of psychedelics a couple times and had really good experiences doesn't mean there will always be like that. You can have a really difficult experience that can really jar you. And if you don't have that support in place, it can be really hard. You can be looking in the face of that cat, right? And so having, having that support set up so that you can draw on them when you need them is vital. A question I get is what if I can't afford to have medical staff, a therapist or other professional, right? That's a good question. 
Um, and and uh, my response would be, well, one, maybe you actually do. Maybe your primary care is on board. Maybe your OBGYN is on board, or whoever you see, you know, and being able to talk with them. Um, maybe you don't need to get a specific psychedelic, you know, mental health provider. Maybe your therapist, again, is on board. Um, and if they're not, you know, maybe um, reaching out to one that you can use your insurance with. Um, and if that isn't a possibility, because, I mean, a lot of providers take insurance, and so that, um, but, but if you're not able to find one that, that you can use your insurance with, um, maybe saving up so that you can maybe see this therapist or this doctor maybe once a month, um, just so you have them in your court, in your ecosystem, to draw on when you need them. Um, psychedelics are about letting go and being present. Why focus on providing certainty and safety? Again, having that certainty and safety, that support, can be a springboard. Maybe we don't realize how effective or how far we can go because we haven't had that support before. Um, I'm sure most of you probably know about the Fireside Project. Um, it is, uh, they provide support during and after psychedelic experiences. Um, they're great. You can call or text them at 62 Fireside. Um, they're open 11 a.m. to 11 p.m. Um, Pacific time. And so they're a great resource. Um, you know, if, if you are having a really difficult journey and haven't set up that ecosystem yet. Even if, even if you have, maybe your ecosystem isn't available right at this moment, right? So they're a great resource. Okay, so the recommended, recommended action to take, write down one type of support person that you would like to add to your ecosystem to support you in your psychedelic journeys, whatever they are. You know, maybe you have one person in your ecosystem. Maybe doubling that, maybe get another person, another type. Maybe talking with your therapist or, you know, um, with a colleague or, or whatever. Whatever you, you feel like you need, because we're all different. We all have our own ecosystems, our own journeys. So just evaluating that and seeing what kind of support you can have. Um, and I think a lot of people work best on deadlines, and so maybe set a deadline to do that by the end of the week, to reach out to, to that person. <clears throat> okay, the third ecosystem, the mental health industry ecosystem. So, um, psychedelics are raising the standard of what we can expect from our mental health community. So, just take a moment and think about what your experience has been with the mental health community. Has it been positive? Has it been negative? Maybe you haven't had experience with it, but maybe your friend has, or maybe your spouse has. Um, I have a lot of patients who come in with um, trauma, actually, from the psych from getting treatment for their mental health. <coughs> Maybe they've tried and tried and tried and tried many antidepressants, and they've had side effects and just terrible experiences. Or you know, I mean, just because somebody has had a difficult experience with the mental health community doesn't mean that the mental health provider wasn't competent, wasn't trying. But maybe they, for whatever reason, there was a disconnect, um, whatever. And so we all have our own experiences with the mental health community. Um, and so we can become disillusioned with the mental health community, community not wanting to have any part of it. And um, one thing I can say about working at a psychedelic clinic is it's awesome. It's, it, it's totally different than working in other fields I've worked in. I've worked in you know, the medical field my entire profession. And I even got, as many other providers, got kind of disillusioned with the medical field myself. I was like, I, mean, I didn't really feel like I was helping people all the time, which is why I went into it in the first place, right? And so um, working at a psychedelic clinic can, can um, be absolute joy. We you know, walk in, I walk in, and we see about 30-ish patients a day, um, and I hear stories every single day about how people are doing better. You know, I hear all the time, this literally saved my life. I can be there for my family. I can wake up in the morning without dread, I can hold down my job. And so it can, it's changed my perspective on the medical community and what is possible. And it's been awesome to see my patients also melt their 
that their, their PTSD and their fears of the medical community just kind of melted away. And so it's really awesome to be part of that. So one, one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that there haven't been a whole lot of new breakthroughs since Prozac um, for depression. So Prozac um, came out in the late 80s, I think 88 or 89, and it was huge. I mean, like, there were lots of reports on it. The news was on it, and this new antidepressant, and it's changing lives, and all these things, right? And so um, the, response rate, the response rate was generally somewhere between 30 to 50% of people had um, a remission of their depression, which was massive. It was more effective than what had been used previously, had less side effects. Um, it was the first group of what is the most commonly prescribed even today, uh, antidepressant SSRI, selective so like serotonin reuptake inhibitors. It was huge, it was massive. But since then, we haven't had a whole lot of breakthroughs in medication. We've had um, new therapy modalities that have been really awesome um, and different things, but not a whole lot of medication breakthroughs since then. Um, so this is a um, study that was done. Um, it was finished in 2006, published in 2007, called the STARDI trial. Maybe some of you have, are familiar with this. But it was a very, um, very important study to um, really nail down treatment-resistant major depressive disorder. And so there were four steps to this study. Um, the first step was to try an antidepressant. The second step was to change that antidepressant or do an augmentation therapy and maybe adding uh, antipsychotic with it or another antidepressant. The third step was a mixture of different things, maybe changing the antidepressant again, a different augmentation, same with the fourth step. And with each of these steps, um, the percentage of people who responded and their depression went into remission increased. But just keep in mind though, even at this step, even though it's 67%, they had to go through all of these steps to get there, right? And so that could be really hard and challenging. Um, so this is really awesome that 67% in this study improved. That is great. A lot of people do well on antidepressants. Antidepressants can get a very bad rap, especially if you have tried them and they're not for you, right? But in reality, they've been able to help a lot of people, thank goodness, who are suffering. But even this, there's still, you know, 33% that didn't respond, right? They went through all these four steps, but they didn't respond. And so with each step, their, their hope of finding help, finding something that works, decreased. And so they're feeling more and more hopeless, right? And so um, those are a lot of the patients that come to our clinic. They tried a bunch of things. Maybe they've tried five, 10. I've had patients with over 25 antidepressants that they tried. That's a whole lot of antidepressants, right? Um, and so they bump up against this kind of glass ceiling of like, well, what is there left? What are the other options, right? Which can be a really, really hard place to be in um, because it's natural that we kind of own that. The reason that this hasn't worked is because something's wrong with me. It's not the medication, it's me, I'm broken, I'm, I'm not fixable, right? And so that, that's, that's a really hard position to be in. Um, you're not crazy for thinking there should be more, but there, well, why isn't there more? Why aren't there more options, right? Um, and thank goodness now we are coming out with more options, legalizing more options, right? Um, and so, like I said, we can, we can own those treatment failures as though we are the failure. It's not the Prozac that didn't work. I failed Prozac. I failed, you know, whatever it is, cognitive behavioral therapy or wh whatever, whatever it is, you know. And so we can develop this self-criticism and this stigma within ourselves that something's wrong with us. And that can really be a huge blockage for deeper healing. That's something that I've noticed in our clinic is a lot of a lot of patients come in thinking that they're the problem. And it's not because we don't we haven't had good options, good treatment options. I've had a lot of people say, you know, the medical community hasn't known what to do with me over the last thirty years. I didn't respond and so my provider would get frustrated and angry, not because he was necessarily angry at me, but he was frustrated that it wasn't working and I wasn't responding, so I internalized that and something's wrong with me, and so it's, it, was, it was hard. It created this blockage, and that can be a centerpiece to 
to keep us from healing that a lot of people don't really recognize, don't really you know, realize is happening. So what is your story of self-criticism with the mental health community, with your individual journey? Maybe you have some, maybe you don't. But a lot of people aren't aware of that. And so look at the inside of, your, of yourself and seeing if that is something that maybe needs to be worked on, addressed, and, uh, moved so that we can finally let go of those, those negative feelings of self-criticism and that something's wrong with us. I want to share one last story about a patient. <clears throat> her name is Vicky. She's a woman in her mid-50s. She has a master's degree, is employed as a chemist, and has no pets and has been married to her husband for seven years. Um, she's had moderate depression, again, most of her life, severe PTSD, early childhood trauma, and severe insomnia that has been determined to be a result of unrelenting hypervigilance, that her mind and body just won't relax so she can actually get restorative sleep. So the treatments that she's done for her mental health are over 20 years of psychotherapy. She's tried several antidepressants. She's even done psychedelic experiences, actually. She did ayahuasca, and she did San Pedro. And she said those are really awesome experiences, but she was still suffering from, you know, this, all of the symptoms I mentioned. She also had medical evaluation just to make, just to rule out, make sure that her insomnia wasn't due to a medical cause, uh, which it wasn't. So she talked with her therapist um, about ketamine, um, and her therapist and her were kind of scared, both of them, because the therapist was scared because he wasn't really that familiar with it. She was scared because she had tried it, um, um, psychedelics in the past and knew that she would become vulnerable. She knew that, you know, safety was a problem in her life because of her trauma, and she knew that she'd be in a vulnerable state. She wanted to make sure that, that where she got ketamine, she would feel safe, because she knew how important that was. So um, she did a lot of research, and she ended up reaching out to us. Uh, she started treatment, and from the get-go, I've actually had very few patients that every single treatment is like, like love and amazing and you know just like life changes. A lot of times it's a mixture of different things, right? Um, but hers were just awesome from the beginning. But beside, but regardless of that, between treatments she was still suffering. She didn't really feel like her mental health was budging, right? And so I tell people. What's the, I mean, what we're treating ultimately is the time between treatments. Who cares if you come and get altered for a little bit and then go back to the exact same that you were? What's the point of that, right? And so um, she, she was kind of frustrated that she wasn't seeing improvement. So uh, we talked and we decided, uh, well, she decided that she wanted to add on ketamine assisted psychotherapy. So she started with um, one of the ketamine assisted psychotherapists that worked with us. And um, it was in those treatments with the therapist that she finally realized the stigma that she was harboring, the self-criticism of failing all of these treatments over the last 20 years and trying so hard to improve her mental health and it just wasn't working and that she, again, she was broken. She, the problem was her, it wasn't the treatments, it was her and she was owning that and that was holding her down like a weight. No matter what she did, it was holding her down. And so she identified that in her sessions with the Canadian Assistant Psychotherapist and finally was able to release that. You know, um, I, I talk with patients about how we can have these deep, dark, angry emotions inside of us. They're like this, this ball, tight, angry, prickly, right? And so we do ketamine or psych a psychedelic and we <coughs> access these these emotions and we bring them up and we expand them a little bit and that we're able to actually look at them and say, oh, okay, so maybe this is the cause or this is what that's affecting and this, you know, like really analyze these emotions. And in doing that, it changes the configuration of that emotion, right? So they're being angry and prickly and dark and deep and we want to shut it down because it hurts, right? We're able to expand it and be like, oh, okay, I get that, it's smooth and movable, right? We can work with that. And maybe even, we expand it to the point that it just floats away. 
But even if it doesn't float away, it's more workable. It's easier to deal with, right? And so um, that's an important thing that we do with, <coughs> with psychedelics in general, is being able to address these emotions and difficult darkness, dark situations, experiences, whatever it is, um, in a different mental state, right? And so because of that, again, she was able to identify that self-criticism that she didn't even realize was there and holding her down. So she opened it up and released it, and it changed everything, everything, right? And so she, again, was able to create this beautiful ecosystem because she identified it and had the support that she needed in a safe place with the right support, the right therapist, to be able to do that. And so uh, the recommendation we have for this ecosystem is to write down your most common self-criticism, self-critical thought, whatever that is. You know, Maybe spend some time thinking about it. Maybe it's something that we actually haven't even thought about, like, like Vicky, right? Um, and then once we identify it, send it love. Send it lots and lots of love, right? Because ultimately, if we can love that, it allows us to love all of us. If we can love that part, that invites us to have love for our entire being, our entire human, right? Both physical and mental. And so maybe there's something holding us down and really identifying that can really be a game changer for us. So what are the three psychedelic ecosystems? First one is society. Second one, personal, right? Third one is the mental health industry. And maybe, maybe that isn't a problem with us. That, that particularly, I mean, not particularly the mental community or our experience with it, but maybe something else that's holding us back, right? So, yeah, those are the three ecosystems. These are the three recommendations, right? So, maybe you don't need all three of these. Maybe you just need one or two, or maybe all three. You know, it just depends on you. But maybe take it some time to look at these and be like, you know what, I really I want to talk to my therapist. Or, yeah, maybe that self-criticism really is holding right. me down. I want to address that. It's time to really allow healing and love to come into my life and my soul. So, again, these are the three ecosystems. Maybe you thought about some of them, or partially of them. Maybe you thought about all of them. Um, and maybe not. Hopefully, you found this information helpful, um, and your role in being there for yourself and, and being there for our movement as a whole, because we all have a part in it, every one of us. Um, but ultimately, taking time to look at, protect, and cultivate these three important ecosystems. So with that, thank you very much. Um, and I think I have some time for some questions. Cool. Is there a medical reason that treatments at twice a week needs to be limited to four weeks, or Great theoretically question. could it go on? Yeah, really good question. Um, no, uh, we do extend them. So the reason we say four weeks, some actually do, like if they're doing IV, sometimes they'll do less, it depends on the person. Sometimes they'll do more. They've actually done recent studies where they found that maybe five weeks or six weeks or twice a week is what's needed before you taper down. The reason I say four is because most of our patients do it through insurance because it's more cost effective, right? It's more feasible. And the FDA, their frequency that they approved based on the studies of Spravato were four weeks or twice a week, four weeks or once a week. And then after that, every week or every two weeks, that's what insurance will pay. Once in a while, there's an insurance that will go more than that, but most are pretty adamant not to pay more. And so we have to follow those regulations, those rules. Um, we do have some patients who will do the Spravato, but then when they go down to once a week, 
they would be able to do a couple of uh, intramuscular injections and just pay for them out of pocket. Or, you know, maybe they're doing great once a week and then a life event happens. Maybe they lose their spouse or they lose their job or whatever and their mental plummets, right? And then they go back to twice a week, but insurance will pay for that, so maybe they do some of them through insurance, some of them not. But we, we're always adjusting the frequency depending on response. Those are generic numbers, but that's a good question though, and we can, we can do it based on a person's response for sure. Yeah. Is nasal as effective as intravenous? Really good question, we get that a lot. So um, they actually just recently came out with a study that said that the ultimate e efficacy is actually very similar. With IV or intramuscular, you may get to that result quicker, um, but ultimately the efficacy is very similar. So um, I have a number of patients that um, will come, they'll start with IV or intramuscular because it can take you know, a week or sometimes even two to get it covered by insurance. And so they're like, I'm gonna pay, I need help now. So they start with IV, switch to Spravato more as a maintenance. Um, but yeah, we, and, and in clinic, we see very similar results um, with the two. So um, I actually don't have statistics on our clinic and the numbers. I actually sent all of that information to a place that I evaluated and I don't have results yet. I wish I had them for this talk. But um, yeah, um, objectively, just looking at our patients, we see very similar results, but sometimes it can take longer to get there with Yeah? Understanding the nasal spravato piece, if you were looking at intravenous versus intramuscular, why would you offer one or the other? So yeah, so we see, again, very similar results between the two. Some people are terrified of needles. They don't want, they don't yeah. want anything even remotely close to a needle. I mean, they close their eyes and get the shot, but it's different than getting an IV, right? Yeah. Or maybe they have terrible veins and they just don't, they hate getting poked five times, because they always get poked five times wherever they go, right? Yeah. And also, IV is more expensive because it takes more supplies and stuff like that, so it is a more expensive treatment, and so but it's also cost savings if you do um, IM instead. Um, but ultimately, we see very similar results. Uh, you have a question? Yeah. Is ketamine addictive? Oh, really good question. I actually was going to add that to the slides and I forgot. So um, we at our clinics have never, oh, I don't know of any patients who have become addicted to it. That was actually a huge fear of mine before we started. I would read studies saying that, you know, as long as you do it, you know, the way that we do it, it's the chance of it becoming addicted is very, very small. But I didn't know. I was like, what, what if we open this clinic and create a bunch of ketamine addicts? That would be horrendous. I mean, just this anxiety, you know? It hasn't found out that way at all. Um, like I said, none of our patients I know have become addicted to it. Um, most patients tell me, I actually don't want to come in and do this because it's inconvenient, I can't drive home, maybe I'm groggy for a couple of hours, you know, I take time off work or whatever it is. So it's, it's inconvenient, but they do it because they feel better between treatments, but they have no desire to do it when they're not getting, coming to the clinic and getting it. And studies, um, they've done a number of studies actually showing that it's not um, extremely addictive at all. I have a lot of patients who actually get ketamine and they decrease their use of other substances. We don't give ketamine for um, addictions of any type, not because it hasn't been shown to be effective, but it's because in our view, addiction is a multifaceted condition, right? And so ketamine can be one of the parts of that healing journey, but it's not the whole thing. And so it's irresponsible for us to be like, we're gonna give you ketamine, good luck with the rest. It should be integrated as an entire, in the entire program, and we haven't done that yet. Hopefully in the future, but we haven't done that yet, so we don't even for that. So, yes? How do you, I guess, how do you reapproach with a patient that has had a, 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 a not so great first experience with it? Yeah. With ketamine or a psychedelic in general? Well, with ketamine, I, I've got this treatment-resistant patient, um, mm -hmm. and she was told not to take her benzo, which her anxiety is just all over the mm -hmm. place. And so she she withheld the benzo, and, and I tried to impart upon her as a pharmacist, you know, okay. your set and setting is really important. Absolutely. And it sounds like your set and setting was, was terrible that right. day. Right. Um, and you have these other, you know, like seven doses of, of ketamine left. Right. 
Um, and she's asking me questions, and I'm going, geez, I mean, set and setting is the best thing I can, you know, suggest to you, but um, I don't know what retrial looks like, and um, what is, I guess, how do you re-challenge patients that have had that terrible initial experience? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And you are spot on. Set and setting are massive. The mindset and the setting you get it in are huge. Um, so um, there are a couple things I'm going to address. The first one is the benzos. So what we tell people um, is that it depends on the person. Some people, you know, without taking a benzo, they are just a wreck. And so your mindset going into it plays a really big role in how your experience is. And so some people use a benzo, you know, once every month or whatever. They rarely need it. So we're like, if you can hold that before, great, because the studies are, are variable. Some say that it can decrease efficacy. Some say it has no effect on it. I know ketamine clinics who give every patient a benzo before they get them ketamine, and they say there's no decrease in efficacy. We don't give a benzo. Um, I have a couple of times ever in like five years, um, but they're specific cases. So if they need that to be come in in a relaxed, calm state, then my recommendation is to take it before. Now, because they've had a difficult experience, they're going to be gun shy naturally, right? And so, what I would recommend is um, maybe connecting them with a ketamine assisted psychotherapist that can sit there with them during it and address those concerns. Um, if they're doing it at our clinic, letting us know, and we can be in there more often, checking in on them and, and helping them through that journey, right? In general, I found that once people are used to ketamine, they actually prefer us not to be in the room with them. Unless it's a ketamine assistant psychotherapist. The reason I say that is because having somebody come in and be like, how are you feeling, what's going on, all these things, right? It can pull them out of their journey. They're like, I was actually working on something really important, and you just came in and kind of took me out of it. And so we found, in general, they really don't want us in there, um, and so we tend to not do it as much. But if we know that that person wants us to be in there more, we can absolutely do that. We want to give support and assistance as much as they want it. In general, like I said, I find that most people, in general, once they're used to how ketamine feels, um, they actually prefer not to have that. But yeah, absolutely talking with the patient, sitting with them more, getting them a, a therapist, um, maybe taking the, the benzo as they normally do, and then maybe as they get used to the ketamine, maybe tapering down on that benzo if they don't need it as much, depending, you know? Um, but definitely talking with that person as a provider to make that a safe place. Because as I said in the talk, feeling safe is a really important part of this treatment because if you don't feel safe, your mind is like, wow, what's wrong? I'm not safe, uh, you know? And, then, and you can really, really freak out um, because you're vulnerable and you don't feel safe. And so talking with the patient and figuring out what what that looks like to give them the support that they need. As a, as a pharmacist, maybe recommending them to talk to whoever their provider is. Well, know? and the provider was there in the room, she says, just like completely comforting her, um, but she was so gun shy mm. of that second treatment and yeah. asking me like the questions that I'm like, sister, we're all, yeah, like, we're sure. all struggling with sure. our own mental health stuff. Sure. Like, you're, you're not broken, like you're completely perfect in right. your own way. Like, right. Give yourself a chance, and right. um, it, it's just like I, I don't know how to. Yeah. Um, actually, two more things. One, um, you can always decrease the dose, right? And so maybe, I mean, at the same dose, you can not feel very altered at all, or very altered, you know, at the exact same dose. Ketamine is the most unpredictable drug I've ever worked with in anesthesia, in a sense of like. Most drugs, you give it, and most people respond within like an 80% window, and then you have like this small percentage that have a different response. With ketamine, it's like the exact same dose can be over here or over here. Well, right? the dual compartmentalization on the pharmacokinetics, it's absolutely so interesting. Uh, it's, absolutely. It's the, the kinetics on that thing alone yeah. are just a, a geek session. Like, yeah. um, it, it's an interesting drug. 100%. The kin like kinetics. And, and so adjusting the dose, although like I said, at a smaller dose, you can still have a very altered state, but that decreases the chances of that, right? Um, but then also, um, uh, lost my train of thought. Um, 
oh, I'm also talking with the person because a difficult experience doesn't necessarily mean a bad experience. Because in my experience when working with patients, the most difficult experiences in the long run are the most therapeutic because they bring up stuff, right? You're going down and looking in this in the water and you're finding all these pearls and everything, and sometimes you find the shark, you know, and that shark you needed to find, and that was hard, you know. And so that's why working with a therapist and all these things, it could bring up a lot of stuff. And so as long as they understand that, and just because they had a hard, scary treatment doesn't mean it was bad, it was wrong, something went wrong. It could have been totally what the patient needed, right? So Yes. Is insurance state dependent? Because I do know of insurance that's covering California. Uh, covering what? Excuse me. Covering what? what? Oh, I am. Oh, I am. Um, yes, it's absolutely dependent on the state. Um, Blue Cross, for example, is a national town, but each individual Blue Cross has their own requirements, their own things. Anthem Blue Cross recently, which is our local Nevada Blue Cross, recently came out with a statement that said, we will not pay for Spravato if it's given with ketamine at all. Like, if you give IM ketamine with Spravato, we will no longer pay for it. They're the only ones I've seen that have done that, but that is Anthem, right? So it totally depends on the insurance. Um, from my experience, the only insurance that will fully cover IV ketamine is VA. Um, and we're the only ketamine provider in our area that is contracted with the VA to give IV ketamine, and they fully cover it. Um, and other insurances in general won't cover it because it's not FDA approved. And so they, even though it can be cheaper for them to pay for IV versus Spravato, because Spravato alone is $1,000, more than $1,000 a treatment just for the drug, which is a whole other rabbit hole we can go down. Um, but They'll pay for that because it's FDA approved, but they won't pay for three hundred dollars for an IM ketamine session because it's not FDA approved. So it's you know. And is Spravato the same type of ketamine as the IV ketamine? Good question. So um, IV ketamine is what's called racemic ketamine, which is a it's a, many drugs are in the racemic form, and so it's made up of two enantiomers, which are like your hands. They look the same, but they're not the same, right? And so. IV ketamine or IM ketamine is made up of S ketamine and R ketamine. So what Spravato is, is it's actually just the S part of the ketamine, right? Mm -hmm. um, Johnson Johnson isolated the S part, turned it into a nasal spray and patented it. Because the only way that you can patent the drug is to either make a new drug or change something about a current drug. So they took the S part, turned it into a nasal spray and patented it. Um, and they were willing to do that and do all the studies because then they could make money off of it, obviously. And so it is the same drug, it's half of it. There are theoretical differences between S and R. Clinically, I really don't see a difference between S and R. Um, you know, I, sorry, S and R combined or just S. So IV ketamine and spravato. Um, there, there are theoretical things that you know, could go to, into if you wanted to, but um, it's really the same, it's really the same drug. Yes? Um, do you have to have previous experience with antidepressants to try it in a So, um, it depends on what you're referring to. For Spravato, absolutely. Insurance requires that. Mm -hmm. um, most insurances, besides United and subsidiaries of United, like UMR, Health Plan of Nevada, those three require that you've tried three. Most require that you've tried two. And some say they have to be from different classes, some don't care. It just depends on the insurance. They're all their own you know, unique thing. But yeah, they do require that you've tried that. The reason is because they don't want to pay for Spravato, which is very expensive when you can take Prozac and it works, it's a lot cheaper. And, but for IM or IV, mm -hmm. those would be? Yeah, so um, uh, uh, I referred to this a little bit in the talk, but part of our, what, one of the roles that we feel like we have as a, in a medic, as a medical office is to follow the guidelines. The current guidelines are that you give it for treatment-resistant conditions. So we do require that you have tried antidepressants to be able to get IV or IM um, because we feel like that's an important role that we have to, to maintain what the current guidelines are. Hopefully that changes in the future, but right now we don't. Yeah. It's kind of a business question. Yeah. 
kind of came up here. Uh, what are your insurance? What, which insurance do we take? No, 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 no. You as a provider, what kind of med, you know uh, liability insurance do you have? To oh, have yeah, yeah. Good question. So we have well general liability, right? But we also have a medical malpractice. Um, not all insurance companies will cover psychedelics, will cover ketamine. And so we currently use GenStar, um, which we get through Gallagher Health, but it is a medical malpractice insurance um, for, that we specifically get for our so ketamine. So does that throw you into a different category? Mm -hmm. or? No, at least it's not as medical providers. Yeah. But again, not all the insurances will cover that, even as a, even as a medical provider they won't. So it just depends on the insurance company. Yeah. yeah. I've been hesitant to put uh, to mention to my primary care mm -hmm. that I've been involved with psychedelics. And I'm just curious as to your experience hearing about people talking with their primary care. Is that something that they're like? I, I worry about having it in my re medical records. Yeah. So how does that work? Story about that. Um, okay, so um, in general, um, I would say most are really open to it. From my experience of patients talking with their primary care, once in a while, someone will be like, you know, I really don't feel comfortable with that. I've actually only ever had one patient whose therapist fired them because they were like, I don't, I can't work with you because you're doing ketamine. Very rare, right? I've had one ever in five years. Um, but that's, you know, their personal opinion. In general, I would say people are pretty open to it. Even, even if they're not like, yeah, psychedelics are awesome, they're open to it, and they're like, okay, if that works for you, great, right? Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I just want to, one more time, reemphasize how grateful, truly grateful I am to be in this field. I, growing up, I actually wanted to be a therapist. That was my goal. Um, I got into college and I did a deep dive into myself and was like, okay, am I gonna do this? I'm not gonna do this in college now, you know? And I decided not to do it because I was worried about taking patients' problems home and not being able to have a personal life, having those boundaries. And I think at that time in my life, I couldn't do it. But long story short, I went into nursing, went into anesthesia, and the universe is like, we need you in mental health. <laughs> <laughs> and thank goodness the universe did that because it is the most rewarding thing I've ever done. I could talk all night about it. And so if you guys have further questions, I'm happy to talk. Um, if you have questions afterwards, please reach out to me. I'm happy to talk. Um, but, yeah, thank you again. Thank you.